All right, everyone. So on Empire, you obviously know that we talk a lot about the institutions coming into crypto. And that is why we are super excited to share that we are hosting the Digital Asset Summit. We've hosted this since 2019. It's coming up in London, March 18th to 20th. Don't miss your chance to get ahead of the curve. You can get 20% off with code EMPIRE20. We'll see you in London. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Empire. First roundup of the year. What are we talking about today, Santi? How are we doing? Uh, doing great. You know, we had our first uh, reminder that crypto is not uh, up only. So, um, you Good know, little reminder. Yeah, you know, I, I'd rather start the year that way. You know, letting people say like, yes, it sounds like it's starting to look like a good year, but you know, you know, it, it will uh, it will keep the DJ spirits in check, I think. So anyway. How's the New Year's? Uneventful. I went to bed at like 11 or so. I was wiped. I had run so much because I'm training for Tokyo. So <laughs> when, like, when's, when's Tokyo? Uh, first week of March. Nice. Yes. So just running a lot these days. And you? Was good. It was good. You know, I had to cancel my, uh, I was supposed to go on this two week trip to Patagonia, but had some, some health stuff. Uh, so had to, had to cancel that. So went upstate. You're looking fresh. I'm not, I've got bar barely any sleep, but, uh, you're looking fresh. Got a, got a meeting with a with a big trad. This is about as nice as I will allow myself to dress up. You know, they're all going to be in suit and tie today. Like walk into this room, I'm sure it's going to be like ten guys suit and tie. Like, oh yeah, this is about as nice as I as I will dress. You walk around Berkeley in a suit and tie. You people look at you like, you know, my first crypto conference. I walked. I was I was coming like straight from work, and I was at J P Morgan at the time. And of course, I took off the tie, but I still had the suit. You know, and people looked at me in the Bitcoin Center in New York, and so oh yeah. And they're like, you must have gone the wrong door, like the. Yeah, I had the same thing in 2017, going to these Bitcoin meetups straight from work. Like, uh, yeah, uh, you know, rocking the tie, rocking the suit. Um, all right, well, you're gonna have to wear that in DAS. So I'm just saying, I don't think this setup is gonna fly. No, I look, I look nice at DAS. Get a get a little nice dapper for DAS. A little <laughs> yeah, dapper for DAS, exactly. Um, so you buying some Nikes? The new Nike drop. So oh, yeah, the new Alpha Fly uh, uh, running shoes came out literally today. In Europe, they came at two in the morning, so I, I stay up late. That's why I didn't sleep. Two oh one comes, sold out. Then they came out right before we started this pod in the U.S. So I'm VP. You know, I'm trying to get it in the U.S. too. Sold out as well. You know, you think an NFT mint is hard? Buying hot Nike sneakers is much harder, folks. I've been dealing with this problem for a while, so I become better at. For me, you know, minting NFTs is, is, is not hard. What is hard is trying to find these shoes. So I didn't get them. You didn't get them. <laughs> so now you'll, what, now you'll just 5X them on, uh, on StockX? Probably. I'll be the yeah. idiot. I was the first listed. Plus my size is also like the one that they know they rip you off. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, Thanks. all right, man. So let's, uh, a couple things I want to talk about today. ETF week. Uh, we got the ETF ahead of us, uh, Jan 8, 9, 10. I think Jan 10 is the official deadline for um, both ARC and 21 shares. So let's talk ETF. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can kick it off with market nuking. Just get your take on that. Um, and mm -hmm. then we can talk about this tax thing that went into effect January 1st. Um, and then maybe we can cover uh, Visa had a cool little crypto announcement that I think went under the radar, but was was pretty cool to see them follow up on something that they shared that they would, would do two years ago. So first things first, um, market nuking. So uh, basically a matrix port uh, report claiming that the US, uh, that the SEC would reject a spot Bitcoin ETF um, causation, correlation, whatever it is, but it kind of uh, proceeded in an, an eight to 10, I think it was 8%, maybe 10% drop in, in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin fell from, I think it was sitting around 45, fell down to what it was sitting at 45.3 and fell all the way down to 40. What is that? 40, 40 and a half. So, you know, what, what does that drop? 8%, 10%. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but if you haven't been following it, Bloomberg analysts and a lot of different folks put the chance of approval in the coming week around 90%. And that is one of the reasons this, you know, Bitcoin's kind of run up in the past few months. Um, but this guy, Marcus Thielen, the head of research for Matrixport, said that he believes all applications are going to fall short of a critical requirement. And he added that uh, SEC chairman Gary Gensler still sees the industry in need of more stringent compliance. 
Uh, he also doubled down. He said, from a political perspective, there's no reason to approve a Bitcoin spot ETF that would legitimize Bitcoin as an alternative store of value. Um, and uh, this guy, Eric Balkunas, over, mm -hmm. over at Bloomberg said, without any sourcing, this report does not line up with the Bloomberg intelligence uh, reporting that we've done. He said, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it would overturn a lot. Um, however, if Marcus has done a lot, a lot of sourcing to back up the report, that's a whole different ballgame. So mm -hmm. uh, market's already rebounded. Bitcoin's up to four, almost 44. ETH mm -hmm. is climbing today. ETH fell from 20... It's from 2380 to... 380 down to what? what? 2195 yeah 2100 and wow. rebounding already to 2270 the time of recording so things came yeah, back up but a, a good amount of love oh, yeah, like, got wiped out solana dropped from solana was the most dramatic one i think it dropped from like 107 109 to 85 that was a 27 percent drop it's now up to 102 so here's an interesting one let me read the biggest seven day losers it's bitcoin cash ETH Classic, Pancake Swap, Terra Classic, FTT, the FTX token, right? So no surprises there. Then there's Matic. Matic is uh, this group, like it's Flow Token, Litecoin, ETH CC, all these things that like don't really matter. And then there's Matic in there. Um, hmm. So, anyways, we can we can. Uh, I thought that was a, a little side interesting point, but uh, yeah, there's ones that actually. Uh, didn't really fall much like Arbitrum hit all time high. Yeah, the L2s is, are having a nice little run. Yeah, we can talk about things that are performing well, but um, not really surprised. Well, I guess we can talk about why a seemingly irrelevant analyst intern report had this cascading effect in the market. Uh, speculation, but I think a lot of it is bot driven. There's a lot of I would I would gather that, and I saw some commentary around this. So I think that it, over the last couple of years, like the market, like traditional markets, has become more kind of bot driven. I wouldn't say it's to the certainly not to the extent like you know equities, but there is a certain amount of like bot activity in crypto, and so um, that could have led to the in, like the start of you know some selling component, and then in and of itself, it shouldn't have this dramatic effect. Of course, when you pair that with everyone's lever to the tits, then yes, like you're going to have, you're going to have a cascading effect of liquidations. And then you clean and all that leverage off, you know, funding rates are getting pretty out of hand. And so there's, uh, I always like to monitor funding rates to just understand and open interest, to understand how much leverage is in the system. And kind of systematically, e even if you go back to prior cycles, like every time funding rates get really hot, it's sort of a ticking time bomb. It's at some point in days, you're going to have uh, a cleanse. Um, and Can you, you explain know, that, Santi? Why, why funding rates are so important? And like, what is, what is the funding rate, basically? Well, everyone calculates it differently, which is a bit hard, right? When you're looking at funding rates across centralized exchanges and decentralized perps, uh, they all kind of have their own methodology. But basically, and we, we had an episode about this, but the funding rate means how much longs or how much, like if you're going long a particular coin on a perp, it's how much you're, you're, you're paying, um, you know, the other side, right? Um, and so when you think about it, in a market, in a very balanced market where there's, you know, every, like there's a, 50% short, 50% long, this funding rates are very, you know, are neutral. But when there's a, a skew towards like a disproportionate share of the market is either long or short, that's when funding rates start getting getting out of whack. And so on an annualized basis, yeah, you're, you're looking at the chart here now, which is a, a good visual kind of heat map representation. Um, so for instance, when you saw the run up of Seoul all the way to a one like 23 on Christmas, you know, there's a fair amount of, um, you know, yeah, exactly. Or bonk for instance, or, you know, I'm picking on two, but uh, you could look at injective, like some of these hot, like, I guess, narratives and coins, um, basically means like, you know, you're, you're, you're paying an enormous amount of money to, to express that view. And so at some point that is, 
that corrects itself. It's like, it's no different than uh, you're farming at a 10,000% APY, you know, that ultimately corrects itself, right? Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's the price you're, you're paying to... It, it's the, from an exchange perspective, it is the mechanism that they use to keep these books balanced, right? And the more people want to, in a scenario where 99 people like are going long and only 1% one per, one is going short, the funding rate gets so out of hand to compensate that imbalance and, the, and to bring it back to kind of normalcy. And so that, that's the mechanism by which, you know, you keep it in check. Yeah. Yeah. It's the difference between the, I think I have this right. It's the difference between the perps, the futures, the, the perps futures price and the index price, right? Yeah, exactly. Which equates to how much you are willing to go to basically, not not borrow in a sense, but uh, pay to to be long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and come on, like Contango, which factors in like storage costs and whatnot, but because these are digital assets, like it's really just the cost of holding the contract. Yeah. Um, and the you know it's that spread between the contract and the underlying price. Let me uh, let me ask you about leverage, Santi. So do you? It's always crazy to me that people are so levered up and get completely wiped on these moves. Like when I, when a day like this happens, I click the buy button a little harder than I do in the past, right? Like it's a it's always a good buying opportunity. Uh, but you see on Twitter, so many folks get wiped out. They're like, oh man, I lost my stack or whatever it may be. So it's always shocking to me that people are still so levered up to the nines in, uh, in crypto. What What is your take on leverage? And how, when do you use leverage? When do you not? Do you use leverage in the traditional way of just like, you know, being 5X levered or 10, 10X levered, or do you lever long and maybe buying NFTs instead of the spot or whatever it is? Like, how, how do you think about leverage? I've used it in the past. Um, I don't have any leverage today. I haven't used it in the last, basically since 2021. I have not put on leverage. Um, I'm just very comfortable sitting on spot. And... It's just more of a lifestyle, more less lifestyle. It's just more of when you're sleeping at night and unless you have someone or you have an algo that is going to be monitoring these things, it is very stressful. Like you just should be prepared for any asset, including Bitcoin, to go down 10% on moment's notice. And it, these are violent moves. Uh, and so you're sleeping at, you know, during that time, you can't adjust yeah. your position. So like funny story in uh, March, what is it during COVID? Uh, I was still a parify and, you know, it was percolating. The code was a thing. And it was that Thursday where uh, it was an actor. I think it was Mel Gibson that got COVID that night. And like a few athletes had gotten it. And I called Ben. I said, Ben, I think this is going to be real. I think it's going to be a pandemic and I think it's going to get ugly. <laughs> I wake up at four in the morning because I was giving a class at NYU and I was in San Francisco. So it was like super early. I go walk to, to, to buy coffee or, you know, I think there was a Starbucks open at five in the morning or something. I look at the prices and like everything's down. And, and I'm like, I, 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 my caffeine situation is getting out of hand. Like I can't even read a screen. <laughs> and anyway, it took me a while to process it. But like I had some leverage on DYDX and had some positions on like levered ETH, you know, like just going long, all wiped. And the issue there was, you know, a lot of times during these violent movements, you stress test the system. So like the Oracle start maybe failing and, you know, the liquidation engines start failing in the case of, you know, March 2020, Maker didn't have a good keeper liquidator system. And so, you know, that added more fuel to the fire. And I think this is why you see these violent movements. I, the, 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 you could argue we're going to continue to see, even in every cycle in a bull market, you're going to see 10, 20% drawdowns of these assets. So yeah. why, why play with fire and why like, yeah. you know, you can't, even, you can't even be lucky if you're dead. So just don't yeah, look, the, the difference between like CFI and DeFi and traditional capital markets is when there's a, uh, you know, the best thing about DeFi is it's all automatic, right? It all, it's all automated and, you, you know, you, you can see everything on chain. The downside is, um, you know, if you get a margin call in traditional capital markets, your banker, your broker will call you up and be like, Santi, look, you're, you're below the limit. Like, you, and you can say, look, I got, you know, this is happening, but I got to give me, give me 24 hours. I'll add it back. A margin call 12, 24 hours to refill. 
Yeah, on on in DeFi, like you wake up and it's been liquidated. There's no call happening. There's no email even, right? It's funny you say that because I, I've been talking to, like after that incident, I talked to a lot of DeFi founders and I said, why don't you build that type of system where imagine is, imagine you have an open position in Maker or Robin. You have the option to pay a slight premium, an ongoing premium as an insurance policy, whereby if there's a liquidation event happening, this is especially important for NFTs where you don't want to lose the NFT. You have you know, more of an attachment where you have like if it, put, it gets put in escrow and there's a time lock to that liquidation and you have that ability like six hours, 12 hours, but you can pay how much. Right. And. I think that type of system would be very useful because in my conversations with funds, a lot of times they don't want to use DeFi because of this, because they right. don't get the call. Um, and so I think you can build something on chain that would mimic this type of mechanism. Yeah. And the keepers would be happy and the protocol would be happy because that increases the fees to the protocol, right? Because in a normal situation, you're just accruing more fees. Uh, and in volatile moments, um, you know, someone's getting paid to, um, you know, you're paying to have that optionality. And so I don't know. I don't know why someone has. A I like that idea. I think the other thing that will happen this year, I think it's uh, Infinex is doing this and, and some other places are going to start doing it as tying. If, if you want, if you opt into it, tying emails into your into your wallet so that um like you, you know, you sign up with your wallet, obviously, but then you can put in like your email, and then what that does is it gives you the ability to, you know, if if, if there's a margin call or something, like it, maybe they'll email you and say, hey, look, you're you're at fifty percent, at forty percent, we're going to start uh, mm -hmm. calling some assets. So you know, fifty percent, maybe you'll get like a notice email or something like that. Right now, there's no way to get notified. Let me ask you a question: Do you use leverage? I I don't because I first off, I mean, you're what we're talking about here is like. Just zoom out for a second. Like traditional investors are excited about, you know, in in the market right now in treasuries, you can get what five or six or seven percent. Um, maybe if you're pushing out into into some like you know corporate credit or something. Uh, equities, you're excited about what eight percent a year, nine percent, ten percent. You're doing awesome. Maybe. Yeah, fifteen. Uh, if you're in some good funds or something. What we're talking about is like, uh, my belief is that Bitcoin and ETH go up two to three x this year, and my belief is that things like Sol go up you know, five, five X or, or even more than that. Mm -hmm. So I think when you're, when you zoom out and you're like, okay, I'm talking about something going up 400% versus traditional markets, they get excited about going up 8%. Like I don't need to get greedy. I don't, no. I yeah. don't need to get greedy about that. I also had, I levered up. I, I was a really early user of what, uh, of Coinbase's, um, you could borrow on your assets on Coinbase and, mm -hmm. uh, played with that. And like, it was, it was very, I mean, it was very addicting. Like you, it's, it's kind of like having a bad credit card habit or something. It was like, I was like, oh, I'm like, and this was 2021. So like all the numbers were going up um, and I would just like continue borrowing. And then when, and to go long and like, it worked very well. Then in 2022, numbers start going down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, it quickly, I was like, and thankfully I paid it all off and it was fine. But like, I was like, oh man, like this could quickly get out of hand. So it's a great point. I, I did that too as well on the bottom. Like I, I borrowed from like American Express, <laughs> took like a 20K loan to buy ETH. And then um, I borrowed in TradFi from, uh, actually from my parents. And I said, look, it was, it was, I was like, I want to go long. And, and I paid them like 10% interest, like loan docs, like everything. Yeah, yeah. And I gave them way like interest were at zero. And I said, look, I'll pay 10% collateralized by a bunch of other assets that I had. And, um, but, but again, uh, on chain is, is quite tricky. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's a matter of preference. I don't think a lot of people should be using leverage. You can use leverage to hedge, but the reason why most people are using leverage is because they were caught off sides. They didn't catch the first uptrend and they want to do a 10 X. Yeah. Oh, that's not true. Actually. Do you, do you want to know when I got really off sides with leverage? I just, it yeah. was 2017. Do you remember you could use credit cards to buy crypto on oh, Coinbase? Well, I remember I got an enormous amount of points. <laughs> I mean, I would get new cards. Oh my God. I forgot about this. I had blocked this memory out of my mind. I would get new cards and basically max out the card and buy crypto. And Bitcoin was running up from a one thousand to twenty thousand. And I was it was, you know, it was like the most money I'd ever 
I was right out of college. I'd never really had any money in my life. And like yeah. to then have money was insane. Oh, yeah. And I just kept doing it. And then the market turned and I got really offsides. And it took me a little bit of time to pay that off. Um, I, wow. well, I, I completely blanked that out of my memory. But thank, I actually think it's a good thing that you can't buy crypto on Coinbase or Gemini or any of these. Remember with BlockFi and Celsius, you could buy you could buy crypto with credit cards on on all of those, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, the, other, the only other time that I ran some leverage was when I, um, I bought some uh, NFTs and I borrowed against the base asset thinking that it is a levered bet. And so I borrowed, like, say you have 100 ETH, you borrow 50 ETH and, and or 100 ETH or you borrow some fraction, like 60 ETH or 50 ETH or whatever. And then you, you know, the, the tricky there is that a lot of times when, when the base asset runs up, so if ETH goes from 2,000 to 4,000, the floor might not actually move in the same yeah. manner, so you can get caught off sides. Uh, but generally, at the time, I thought NFTs were a levered bet. Are you still thinking about doing that? So, no, I didn't. I, I thought it was already pretty priced in. So I, I was thinking of doing this trade where I would borrow against my soul uh, and buy a bunch of Tensorians um, to kind of as a proxy of getting the as a proxy of getting exposure to growing NFT activity in the uh, Solana ecosystem in the absence of not having equity exposure to tensor um i said okay well maybe i can just borrow you know with a healthy margin so 20 percent of my stack or whatever go buy like thousands of tensorians or whatever and then just play that but the math was such that i i didn't feel that i was getting it was a i think the, the price of tensorians kind of already really reflected that trade so i was a bit late to that mm. so i did not you didn't do that no what do you think about punks right now uh, generally about the price or just punks? As I was looking at the punks floor last night and they, what is it? Now? I, think it I think they were at, they peaked at US dollar value of 400,000, I think it was. And now they're sitting around, let's call they're it 55.69 ETH. So that's 125K. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, all right, they peaked at 440, no, 420 uh, in US dollars. Now they're at 123. It, I believe it was on ETH terms. If you price that in ETH, I think it was 125 Here. ish was the uh, the top. Yeah, there we go. One, I remember I, bought, I literally bought one at 120. I bought like a base 115. <laughs> yeah, I bought a, a, a low trade punk at uh, 125 at the time. ETH was. You know, it was like a hundred. It was like five hundred k USD, uh, and I'm still holding that. <laughs> so, uh, though again, I, I didn't, and I, and I have these punks like hanging in my wall. And so every time I wake up and walk, I'm like, okay, God, I remind myself of I'm always <laughs> so far been a pretty bad trade. But again, it wasn't a trade for me, so I, I collect without the intent of selling. How many punks do you have? Can I, is that a? I'm just. Publicly two, publicly two. Undisclosed. Um, actually, the, the the other one, the, the one with the bandana, I bought for 125, and uh, that was the top. That was like the top. So I have it. Maybe it's a good point to remind myself of, like, yeah, you buy the top. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No matter how smart you are, you will top tick. I think <laughs> uh, you always will top tip. You'll round trip. You'll do all these things. And welcome to crypto. Mike, Mike's gonna get mad at me for sharing this, but I think Mike bought Coinbase stock at like it's it's wow. not even on the chart because it's like it was like the high of it was like the absolute high, not even of the day, but like of that minute. Yeah, it was a satellite candle or whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's great. Leverage is something that. Um, is for very sophisticated people and even even sophisticated people blow up so yeah. they blow up in traditional markets and crypto are less efficient uh less robust kind of from an infrastructure pr perspective and so even though it's more battle tested you have to just be aware that these mechanisms funding rates may not work properly during stressful times and so yeah don't don't play cute you know play long game yeah there's this book market I think it's Market Wizards, Market Wizards, where this guy, Jack Schwager, interviews like top 10 to 20 best hedge fund managers. I think it's Mark, I think it's Market Wizards. It might be a different one I'm thinking of. But anyways, if you go, if you read that book, they all sound super smart, brilliant investors. 
if you look at who's still around of these hedge fund managers, I think only one of 10 or one of 15 or something is still around because every single one of their funds has blown up by yeah. getting offsides and getting Honestly. too confident and too cocky. So here's my, you know, that's such a good observation. I'll just say one last thing. And I want to, first I want to ask you one thing. Do you get more stress, anxiety? Maybe you don't at all during a bull market or a bear market? Bull market for sure. hundred percent. Right? Yeah, it's cool. I mean, bear markets are very low stress. The only reason a bull, uh, the only reason a bear market is stressful is a, if you don't believe in the long-term price of crypto. So you're worried about the dollar value going down, which I, which I like, I have zero stress about what was stressful was like, I mean, Blockworks got 10 times harder, like for Blockworks is going to be very hard in a bull market. It's going to be really hard to hire people. It's uh compensation is going to get completely out of whack. Like it's going to be, we're going to, there's money everywhere. So we're going to start trying to ch like chasing money. Even if you say that you, you, you won't like, there's going to be a lot of money all over the place. And like, that's going to be tough, but like Blockworks got a lot harder in the, in the bear just cause like, you know, the ad market dried up and stuff like that. But um, no, the bull, the bull market is more like anxiety inducing and stressful because, um, uh, yeah, for, for many different reasons. Yeah. Same for um, you, I'm assuming. Yeah, same. The, the, only, the other thing I want to say is on this point around market wizards is um, like the, <laughs> some of the advice that these people are giving, if you read the book, it's like, and, and uh, it's like, don't lose money. Um, rule number one. And it's like, you really can't be lucky if you die. And so I, I think it's just, it's funny that at some point, like greed gets into the equation and, uh, you know, these people just, it's easy to put on leverage. Um, but, uh, and at the time you think that you're going to structure it better than most, but you know, it's not. Yeah. It's hey, not. I, I feel similarly about, uh, leverage as I do with trading, by the way, too. Like you want to <laughs> know, like there's all these people that were trying to trade through the bear market. You want to know who made more money? People who just like held Bitcoin, ETH, and Solana. Yeah. Right. Probably. Yeah. That's why I think it's foolish to try to trade in and out of all this stuff. Like, yeah, you're going to like trade this Arbitrum run up. Like I just sit on ARB for the whole bull market. And like, you'll probably do better if you're, than if you're trying to like flip from ARB into Celestia back into, you know, Gito, like just sit. At some point, uh, people have asked for it, but I'm happy to do an episode of all the mistakes I've done <laughs> documenting because I've documented the most. Um, of all the mistakes I've done <laughs> in crypto. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, let's do it. All right, everyone. So we talk a lot about the institutions coming into crypto on Empire. Santi and I are both headed out to London March 18th to 20th for Blockworks's eighth ever Digital Asset Summit, DAS. This is an institutional buttoned up conference that we've hosted since 2019. I like to joke that it is probably the last remaining kind of suit and tie event in crypto. People are still wearing suit and tie. It's pretty funny, but you'll actually hear from a lot of the largest institutions in the world coming from Standard Charter, FIS, JP Morgan, Framework folks coming out, Wintermute, Van Eck, Goldman Sachs. There are a couple big themes of this conference. One, Bitcoin Catalyst, the halving and the spot ETF. Two, a view from the buy side. Three, RWA's token organization and stable coins, four global regulatory frameworks, five institutional infrastructure, including banking and payments, and six, the macro case for crypto. If you have anything to do with the institutional side of crypto, you have to be there. Santi and I got your back. We hooked you up with a 20% off code. It is Empire20. There is a little competition running internally at Blockworks to see who can drive the most number of tickets. So help Santi and I out, register with our code and you get 20% off. That is Empire20. All right, let's give a little update on the ETF. So here's, here's what's going on. So basically um, uh, January 10th is the ARC deadline and I think the 21 shares deadline. Um, last week, this guy, Eric Balkunis, um, at Bloomberg said that the SEC is ready to approve spot Bitcoin ETFs, but only if they have clear language around cash only creations and have a signed agreement with an authorized participant. Um, there is this scenario where if ARC were to withdraw at the SEC's request, and ARC is the first one in this kind of like long list of folks who have filed, um, ARC, if ARC were to withdraw at the SEC's request, then the next deadline is March. However, uh, the, uh, Balkunis, who's uh, Speaking of DAS and uh, has been on some of, some of the other 
BlockWorks pods recently. Uh, he thinks that this delay situation is a, is a long shot. And I think the idea here is that if you, aka the SEC, if the SEC intends to deny, they would have just denied at this point instead of just kind of like floating around. So there are two um, there are two th- things that I thought were interesting with with the AT, uh, with the ETF. One is authorized participants, and the other is fees. So the first was um, a lot of people are talking about who is the issuer of the SE, uh, of the ETF. Right? Is it a BlackRock ETF? Is it a Fidelity ETF? Is it a Bitwise ETF? I think the authorized participants are also really interesting to look at. So APs are the entities that create and redeem shares of an ETF. And you know, typically shares can be exchanged for a similar basket of securities that reflect the holdings of the ETF uh, or obviously for cash. So uh, Goldman is the big, Goldman just got into the game. Goldman's in talks to become an authorized participant for uh, both the Grayscale and the BlackRock ETFs. So what that means is they would be responsible for the creation uh, and the redemption of ETF shares. Some other ones are uh, Fidelity named Jane, Jane Street and JP Morgan as its APs. BlackRock named also Jane Street and uh, uh, Jane Street and JP Morgan as APs. Valkyrie tapped Jane Street and Cantor Fitzgerald. Uh, Wisdom Tree also named Jane Street. Um, who else? Invesco is using JP Morgan and Virtu. Grayscale hasn't been announced, but I think the APs are going to be Jane Street and Virtu. So there's kind of this like. There's the issuers of the ETF and the creators of the ETF. Then there's this group of like five to six folks, right? Goldman, Jane Street, JP Morgan, Canner, Virtu, who are emerging as like the go-to APs for these ETFs. And I thought it's an interesting list to look at. I mean, it's like everyone, right? Um, Andrew Kang had a good post about this, actually. And and I certainly believe it, which is when you think of it, like this is... Uh, every so many years, Wall Street gets an opportunity to sell an entirely novel new 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 thing and to assume that like like it's just i i'm not sure people realize that the the way kind of the wall street machine works right and go watch like you know boiler room or you know there is a very big incentive for i mean these people get paid on commission like i'm not saying they're this is not a product that they should you know sell i mean obviously we're we believe in it and whatnot but it is, uh, you know, the fees are likely higher, right, for these ETFs. It's like a new product. And so probably relative to your traditional vanilla ETF. Um, so the, you know, it, Wall Street is a very commoditized business, especially selling securities. And so um, at the end of the day, this is a, another fee stream for them, and it will be yeah. an important one. So it, it almost becomes, uh, I, I think if you understand that, then you you kind of see how you believe in a world where one, everyone, every bank is going to be a participant. Everyone that is, has an ETF type of line of business, whether it was an AP or, or just like wealth management kind of division, um, because probably the commissions are going to be higher and, you know, the, the, you're going off of his base of zero. And so it's a new product you're selling. And so I think that Andrew has a good post, we should link to it, but uh, understanding kind of that mechanism is, is, is no pun intended, I guess is funded as mechanism capital, but it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, we should have Andrew on the pod. Um, that'd be a fun yeah. one. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you know, uh, the the, I, I, the the few products that are, exist today have a pretty high fee, right? Uh, so, like higher than your typical. Yeah, they have they have high fees, but um, if you look at what the fees are going to be, uh, it's actually lower than I thought it was going to be. So if you look at the Invesco one, which I think that's a Galaxy partnership. So Invesco Galaxy, that's no fees until five billion AUM, uh, oh. and then Fidelity, that, who oftentimes sets the sets the price of ETFs, um, they'll they'll tend to okay. come in lower. Uh, they're coming in at thirty nine bips. Okay, so, so like too high. It's it's high for an ETF, but like not as high as I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah, because yeah. for context, your traditional like S and P ETF, like tech ET, like just your plain vanilla ETFs are. Relative to 39 bips, it's what, like 20? Uh, like, bips? yeah, tw- tw- you know, 20, 20 like 25 high. bips. And then if you have just like, yeah, if you have like the, you know, just the Vanguard or the Fidelity, like uh, what, whatever the main, like, you know, tracking QQQ or something, like that's 10 bips, I want to say, or 11 or something like that. So, you know who's uh, missing from this list that I think is going to be a colossal uh, regret for them is uh, Vanguard. Vanguard has just said we're not playing in the, in the Bitcoin ETF market and, 
man, what a swing and a miss because they have, I mean, Vanguard's the largest ETF business in the world. Like what a colossal miss for them, in my opinion. Uh, I would love to see a prediction market of uh, when, when Vanguard gets into the game, whether it's, uh, you know, within less than a year or 2025 or just never. Yeah. It's, I don't think it's ever. I think it's just at some point they get in the game. Yeah. You know what? I've been thinking about this idea around prediction markets that we talked about on our predictions pod. I really want to, we should have an empire like little account on poly market. And then when these things come up, we just create the predictions. And I I don't know, we could get something going there. All right, Shane, if you're listening, uh, come up with an idea. Uh, It is basically what you're saying is to help keep us accountable. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Just, just to show us how really wrong that we are. Oh, we're terribly wrong. Yeah. Um, all right. So there's a, uh, there's a new crypto tax reporting obligation that took effect on New Year's Day. So I want to sh- fill you guys in on this. Basically, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, if you guys remember that, Congress passed it in November 2021. It included a provision that amended the tax code to require anyone who receives $10,000 or more in crypto in the course of their trade or business to make a report to the IRS about that transaction. And that report has to include, among other things, the name, the address, and the social security number of the person whom the funds were were received, the amount received, and the date and the nature of the transaction. And if you don't, this is the kicker, if you don't file a report within 15 days of receiving the transaction, you could be found guilty of a felony offense. So that uh, provision, tax code amendment that was passed November 2021, this law just became effective on January 1st couple days ago, and all Americans are now subject to it. It is a self-executing law, meaning there's no requirement for any additional regulatory action or implementation by a government uh, government agency for it to be enforced. Once it is passed and signed into law, aka January 1st, it was immediately operational and enforceable on its effective date. And uh, shout out to Coin Center, who I basically just read their post on this. Um, But they, they actually filed a suit against the Treasury Department uh, challenge in June of 2022 that challenged the constitutionality of the new law, but that case is still in the courts. So as of today, if you receive more than ten thousand dollars in crypto uh, via either trading or your business, you have to file a report within 15 days under penalty of law. And uh, yeah, well, uh, so no, that's the that's, the, law, that's US, the update. What you say? U.S. tax persons only, right? What'd you say? That's for U.S. people. For U.S. people. Yeah. So uh, not relevant for you. No, nah, but it, I mean, I sympathize. It's 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 a it's a huge pain. I mean, fifteen days is like f- reporting anything in fifteen days is a pain in the ass. Like, I, it's that's a that's a quick turnaround. Um, Man, I mean, I I still file in the U.S. because I have Nexus there, and like you, like the amount of. The amount of fees that I've paid CPAs, I've like at some point hired four, five when like, like DeFi summer was crazy. And so you had to like, that that first year was just preparing taxes was just, but yeah. like, I just don't get, it shows that they don't, I mean, it's, it's not straightforward, right? Like it's uh, first off it's coin center makes the argument. It's not constitutional, but at the very least it's not straightforward. Like if you're a, if you're a minor or validator and you receive block rewards of let's say 10,000 plus dollars, whose name and address and social security number are you reporting there? Or if you trade on a DEX, um, and it's a crypto, let's say, uh, you know, an ETH for AVAX or crypto for crypto swap, you receive $10,000 in, let's say you swap. ETH for AVAX or something, who are you reporting there on the other side of that? And what standard should you measure whether an amount of a particular crypto is equivalent to more than $10,000? Like if you buy, I don't know what pudgies are at right now. Let's When pudgies were at 10, like is a pudgy worth 10,000? Is it not? Because it's illiquid. Like what do you, mm-hmm. so it's it's very, it's uh, I mean, I get it. Look, it's, uh, a shit show. It's, it's an information game and they want to uh, understand who the participants are in this whole economy. I think there are better ways to do that, uh, less taxing from a time perspective. Like there's a great blog, Marginal, um, what is it? Marginal Revolution. Marginal Revolution, yeah. And there is a great piece over the years that he talks about like the GP, the, the GD, like the the economic impact of the filing taxes in the US, which is relative to other countries, is is 
like the amount of time that people have to dedicate to filing their taxes is very unproductive for the economy. And it's like a, if we were to simplify that, like countries like in Scandinavia and Singapore, like it is a very much more streamlined process, um, like versus you having to extend in every quarter or like, you know, it's just crazy, right? Uh, it is not like trivial. Like it would have a massive economic impact if we were streamlined. But again, it's a, the, the fact that the tax code is very complex is a feature, not a bug. <laughs> you know, it's uh, anyway. So it's, why is it a feature, not a bug? Because the more complex, the people that can pay for the complexity of the tax code and understand it cannot find certain. Oh, it's a feature. It's a feature for the rich. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Look, look, I mean, like. This is the whole criticism of like folks like Trump and whatnot, like not ever paying to like their effective tax rate is like not your typical 30, 50 percent for normal people. Um, you know, their strategies that and, and the more the anyways, Iran. But yes, exactly. Yeah. That. I mean, it applies to businesses, too. Like Blockworks gets paid in crypto. A lot of our deals are not like is USDC crypto. Right. And we, have to, right? I mean, then we get we get more than ten thousand dollars in USDC like every day day or every other day or something like are we reporting just every day sending a new transaction to the IRS? like maybe i guess we will it's like a, a normal form it's it's like i mean i don't even get if you sent do you send it to fincen or do you send it to uh or or the irs or, or both like, of them right certain things like they're still mailing out this stuff with in incredible amount of pi like sensitive information to outdated addresses Updating your information with the IRS is like a super complicated process. It's not like their website is very streamlined and modernized. It is the most, among the most antiquated, them and the DMV are the most. When I was trying to pay my New York taxes for like four days, the site was down. And I was like, I'm yeah. trying to pay I mean, you guys. <laughs> I'm still waiting on taxes that I paid as an intern at JP Morgan in 20, 2009. Oh, you're not getting those back. Sure, <laughs> and my son is like, they may mail it to you within the next one or five years. The address that I put on that file, I don't live there anymore. I can't update that address. So it's like, yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Yeah, I uh, I didn't cash a tax refund in time. Oh, and uh, so I called, the, I called them. First off, it took like eight hours to wait on the phone. And then they're like, yeah, we'll send you a new check within the next 12 months. I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah. Right. No, um, the very last thing I want to call out is actually uh, Visa announced um, that they're piloting a uh, crypto customer loyalty platform, um, like a, basically an NFT loyalty platform. I just thought this was cool. Like they, in 2021, if you remember, they launched a crypto advisory unit to help their clients and their partners kind of navigate crypto. And at the time, they cited a crypto rewards program as a possible offering for which they could build. And uh, yeah, you know, two, two and a half years later, it's cool to see them them follow up on this. So the, basically the platform, it's a customer engagement platform called the Visa Web3 Loyalty Engagement Solution. And what it does is it helps brands create wallets where they can store reward points and experiences on behalf of uh, consumers. Um, and it's a, it's cool. It's an NFT led uh led platform that's uh you know i think they'll basically sell this or help their clients build it or something like that and then it's kind of b2b to c and then their clients will figure out what kind of rewards they want to have for for their customers so that's great it's, it's yeah. great to see to continue on this like you know adoption and i think they appreciate the opportunity better than most yeah. um i wanted to we don't have to go deep into this because i think there are people that are better at talking about it but you had it as a prediction. I did too. Restaking is a risk. The rehypothecation of security. Um, I think we should be on top of this. There was a most recent thread that I saw you commenting on, David from a bank list. He was like, "Eigenlayer on quotes will cause 2008 like like global financial crisis on Ethereum." He says it's it's some of the biggest cope I've ever seen on this app. I've seen worse, but anyways. We'll take that and you say, well, and you respond, that is big cope and FUD, but also restaking is about to get insane. Probably starts yield farming 2.0 that rivals DeFi's summer. Restaker, restakers layers several layers of tokens on top of each other. That's a lot of chains on the same underlying asset. Feels scary, question mark. And David responds, I think it's pattern, I think pattern match, I think it pattern matches with a lot of scary things we've seen before. And he says like euthanasia roller coaster tm 
but slashing prevention and risk mitigation strategies are also numerous. And this is where I think we should double click on. And this is the side, and, and this is aside from how eigenlayer contagion risk is overblown. Um, look, I think there are numerous restaking providers out there, not to pick just an eigenlayer, but if I were to just, I want to end the episode with maybe something that we should follow up in a future pod. And it's this restaking component because we had the eigenlayer guys, I think it was about a year ago. It was like January of last year. And I was going back and listening to that episode because look a lot, I think they've done They've continued to develop. There were certain things in that episode where I, I didn't come fully satisfied with certain responses of how they were like collecting this trusted group of people to like act as like the security council, if you will. There's certain mechanisms that I think are worth updating. Maybe we should have the eigenlayers again and maybe a panel of other people that are like doing deep research on this because it certainly feels like you're stacking more risk. It's certainly not making the chain more secure. Um, but the question is how much more risk and yeah. what are these quote, quote, slashing prevention risk mitigation strategies? Well, are they sound? And how do you really know if you haven't battle tested them? So anyways, I would love to, to really do a yeah. deep dive. I mean, let me just finish, like, just to respond to that last David thing that I said, I said, I, so I think what I said to him is I think eigenlayer FUD is dumb. But I, what I think is going to happen is that 50, maybe 100 liquid restaking token platforms launch this year. It's going to be mm -hmm. insane. Um, and I think most will be launched by good, well-intentioned builders. But some are going to take these crazy risks, pull in a lot of capital, um, and they inevitably blow up. And that's where my concern lies. And I think actually Mike, uh, also you know, partner in crime over here at BlockWorks, he had a good take. He said, I think there's a middle ground between these views. I bet we have a big blow up in restaking feels inevitable actually, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it or won't be successful. Blowups have been happening at banks since since time and we still have those. So, I mean, just like, it's all, we're not just taking risks though. Like I, I do think restaking is good. Like restaking provides a service that the market needs, right? So like Eigenlayer is a protocol as a reminder to folks like Eigenlayer is a protocol. If you guys missed that episode that we did with Sri Ram, um, you, you, you should just search for it and listen to it, or we can have them on again. But Eigenlayer is a protocol that facilitates restaking of liquid tokens, that's LSTs, such as Steeth, to, and they do that to securely, to secure uh, these things called AVSs, actively validated services. Um, and people call it like, if you see this word, like programmable trust, that's what they're talking about. So AVSs use Eigenlayer to bootstrap their security model with restaked ETH. And AVSs can be chains, it can be networks, middleware applications. And the, the problem that they're solving in the market is that prior to Eigenlayer, uh, securing and properly distributing a decentralized system like an L1 was a really big undertaking. Um, it took a lot of money and a lot of time. So if you take, for instance, like Bitcoin and ETH, like those took years to reach critical mass. The concern that I have is it's just a lot of layers. Um, there's now like four layers of risk that you have. You have first, you have the risk of staking your ETH. Then you have the risk of liquid staking ETH. Then you have the risk of restaking ETH. Then you have the risk of liquid restaking ETH. You're exposed to both slashing and smart contract bug risk at each layer. So the more layers you stack on top of these things, like uh, the riskier and riskier it gets in my mind and the more claims on a single underlying piece of ETH. And then what's going to happen is more claims on underlying pieces of random tokens, like uh, the, the riskier it gets, I think. Um, so is it a uh, typical summation or exponential risk? Because you, you, when you stack these type of things, sometimes the risk is not one plus one. It's actually one, you know, whatever probability, like, you know, the risk just blows out of proportion. Um, I don't really know. I think. And, like, then, and then what's about to happen. I don't know if you've seen some of these deal, like these companies getting built is uh -huh. you're going to be, there's going to be re liquid restaking DeFi that launches. Okay. So like, here's the four, four layers of risk. It's staking ETH, then liquid staking ETH, then restaking ETH, then liquid restaking ETH. But then there's, there's even more layers. There's like, you're going to be able to deposit your liquid restaking token, let's say into an AMM DEX you'll get an LP token back in return. Then you can deposit that LP token into a, let's say a money market as collateral. So then you can borrow even more ETH to liquid restake. Now you've got like seven layers of, of, of risk in the process. I actually think uh, Chainlink God has laid out some of these risks better than mm -hmm. most. Um, so maybe we could 
do an app have, with him or something, but yeah. Have him fishy and maybe other people. Um, does it feel like when I want to maybe challenge one thing you said there is what is the end game? Like what, when you say it is a providing a useful service, a well, well point continuum, what is the actual use other than art, like artificially like creating yield opportunities? Like wh what is the, it, it's like, I see this in a way of, um, every, okay. I have two responses here. One is every time you make it cheaper to go build something, new things come to market. So if you take like, uh, AWS or something like AWS and these cloud providers, it makes it much easier and, and cheaper to launch, to go launch a company, uh, to go launch a SaaS company. If you take like Squarespace and Webflow, like it makes it easier to build a website. Eigenlayer is making it easier to build distributed systems. Um, now the problem with this is every time you launch, go launch a new thing, like let's say every time you go launch and double click on that before you go further, it's this idea of shared security of using when you have a validation of a distributed system somehow their mind their thesis is that is a very kind of that process can be utilized in a more efficient manner and and in a way like because the way ethereum is architected you apply the same sort of validation for everything and maybe there are different security yeah. assumptions or sec or the the amount of energy that you apply to a certain validation can be different like you're creating like more more like consumer preference if you will like the ability to like distribute and redistribute security by rehypothecating it or or like mm. okay okay so this you, is really you're quite, yeah you're quite you're well, i think what you're getting at is like how useful really is economic security to ethereum um exactly. yeah. and i i mean right now it's deemed in the market to be useful. Like I think say, or some, you know, some, some other folks are like renting or bar, or I don't know what the right word is like renting security from Ethereum using eigenlayer folks like that. Like it is a product that the market is, is using right now. Like as a, like a SaaS pro if you were, if it was a SaaS product, they would have customers long term. I could make the argument that economic security is a bit of a meme. Like let's, let's play this out. Consider you're a new protocol, like you Santi, the founder, and you want to bootstrap security. So, um, you know, we, we, you could go get validators and all that kind of stuff, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's kind of expensive and stuff like that. So you, so you, what you do is you borrow economic security from, from Eigenlayer. The problem with that argument though, is, is like, if you want to attack the network, there are so many other ways to do it that are more efficient than a 51% attack, right? Like if you had a, a chain that was worth ten dollars, and uh, you needed to attack, like you want what you're, I think preventing against here is someone buying five dollars five dollars worth of stuff because then they can corrupt the chain, right? A fifty one percent attack. In reality, I don't really think any chains get attacked by fifty one percent attacks. They get attacked by like human problems and people problems and multi sigs and smart contract bugs and like that's really what you need to prevent against. So I, what ends up happening, like if you take pre eigenlayer world is you go create some hype, you get some validators, you hope the number goes up enough so that the 51% attack is too expensive to do. You're not, they don't, you, do, you weren't really raising money to then go buy economic security. Um, yeah. I mean, look, uh, I that's the counter argument, I think, to economic security. I just feel like that this is a, a way up, uh, a mechanism right, right now I, it's a way to attract users it would be I don't see the benefits outweighing the risks of introducing way more fragility to security because you you should never compromise on that but i understand why they are doing it in the way the ethereum is architected that i don't necessarily think you have that problem in a chain like cosmos or solana for instance and that's what i want to focus on because at what point do you really put in at risk the core kind of tenets of a decentralized distributed system to focus on what is i think a like for scalability reasons I, like it's a fine I, I think it's a fine line we're treading here is all i'm saying i'm not smart enough 
and I need to do more work to have a more informed opinion. But my intuition, when I was talking with algae layers publicly in this pod, and I just doesn't feel like it's going to end well. I don't want to be that like canary in the coal mine that just says it's not going to end well and just stop there. I want to have a more nuanced and informed view. And so I want to have smarter people come in and comment on that because I think it's the right time to focus on it uh, as these things gain. It's going to be a top hot I think it doesn't end. If you had to predict something now, do you think it doesn't end well because um, uh, everyone ends up building on top of Eigenlayer and there's risk of like centralized risk of Eigenlayer? Do you think it's because um, one of these like liquid restaking token platforms blows up? Do you think it's a mass restaking uh, related <laughs> slashing event that that occurs again. My understanding back then was, I think you're transitioning now to more human judgment as it relates to the allocation of certain resources, meaning security. Because my when we interviewed Ram and Calvin, right, or what's his, it was it was this council initially that was like when you I think when you determine like how security gets like different use cases require different sets of security. And so it becomes a bit more efficient. That, that was like my impression of it. And it may be wrong. There is a human element and judgment there. And I just think humans are never good at this stuff. Yeah. They're never good. Like you're, it, they will make mistakes. And this is why we build in crypto because we don't rely on humans. We rely on a set of smart contracts that, okay, are built by humans, but you can have formal verification and other things to, you know, battle test and get more Lindy. And unfortunately, crypto when things break, they really can break. And so building Lindy, you know, Ethereum has built a lot of Lindy and security as a, as a base layer. There's been parts of the stack of, built on top of Ethereum, like DeFi, that are broken at times, smart contracts that have had bugs. Um, and even Ethereum has had certain things that needed to be patched. But yeah, uh, that's that's my only, yeah. not my only, it's, that's what I worry where we, are somehow of the mind that we can take a lot of this very important resource uh, that through validation or mining, we get security. And then we somehow are now of the mind that we can further optimize that, that resource by like allocating it to different use cases and renting it out. And I think in that process, I want to question that assumption. I want to, I want to have smarter people come in here and talk about the merits of that, but also the risks of that. And look, I don't, to your point, I sort of agree. I don't think all restaking providers are going to be created equal. Um, and as we know, people yeah. chase high yield. And so, you know, as there can be blow ups, you know, there can be blow ups in any smart contract, not just a restaking provider. The implications of one are vastly different than the other, I think. Um, you know, in DeFi, you also have these, like the money Lego concept is, is very sexy and it, composability is a beautiful thing. The fragility of that is, you know, it's sort of like you're, you're only as strong as, as, as your weakest link. So if there's a, a, it's like a Jenga tower, if there's a particular Lego in that tower that falls apart, well, it's very, you know, like if Avi were to have a, a, a terrible situation then it has cascading effects across this financial system that is very interconnected um so yeah it's sort of more of a i want to talk more about the guardrails i want to talk more about the like the the, the, the slashing mechanisms the contagion mechanisms i feel like a lot of people are just saying borrowing these type of concepts that we understand in normal validation in a normal proof of stake system oh you know you have slashing and you have like this is the mechanism by which you know if, if a validator like goes offline or you know, is acting maliciously, then there is a roundabout around that to for the chain to continue to operate or whatever. I just don't think it's that same logic applies to restaking. One, we haven't seen it too. I think there's a lot of people that don't really truly understand how these mechanisms work. I want to bring on people that actually understand how that works to then make that distinction. Because I think the eigenlayer guys in the pod were saying, look, there are some things that we still need to build and we don't know all the answers to these things. But then you see people commenting on Twitter that they fucking know everything. And it's like, no, no, like it's just important to call this out and say, we don't know. And before you ape into eigenlayer or whatever other restaking provider, just understand that these are have very little Lindy to them. Yeah. I'm not saying they're not going to work. I'm also accepting the fact that they're going to get built because you can't stop this trend. We will, why don't we do this? Let's wrap this part about 
yes. liquid restaking and the risks of it. Why don't I will we will invite a couple of founders building these liquid restaking platforms. They're going to be pretty early. Some of them might even be pre-launch or something, but they are some of the smartest people I think. Anyone building in this is thinking about this 24/7. I think people understand that it's risky. So we will um uh, I invested in one called called Rio because of this reason. They're kind of like the adults in the room of liquid restaking, I thought. Um so yeah. we can invite them on or some other folks as well. So yeah. Let's do it. I thought let's make that a priority. All right. All right. You're getting <laughs> nervous. I see I see the sweat beads dripping. <laughs> I have a I have a content recommendation for you. Nice. Um um it is I was going to make a book recommendation, but I'll make a podcast episode recommendation. It's uh, the fee market episode that Mike did on Bell Curve with Sam Hart from Skip uh, Protocol from from Cosmos yeah. and uh uh oh my god, I'm I'm sorry to the A16Z guy, really smart guy who's great from uh, Andreessen. Uh, he's a researcher over there. Um but they did a whole episode on fee markets. They basically started with Bitcoin fees, the Bitcoin fee market, then moved over to ETH fee market, then mm -hmm. talked about um uh, 1559, then talked about Solana fee markets um, and like maybe what the Solana folks are going to run into uh, with the problems with their fee markets in, you know, maybe six to 12 months. Um, mm -hmm. And then talked about like potential ideas for different fee markets, like maybe unbundling gas or different things that, you know, maybe it's a uh, credit markets where, you know, you get actually paid to transact on chain or it's uh, zero, zero fees to transact on chain because of some different credits. So, or maybe it's Aave says to Uniswap, like, Hey, your users can trade here for free. I'll pay for your, you know, and vice versa. So really interesting uh, episode on fee markets uh, on the bell curve feed. So that's my, I would recommend folks listen to that. Nice. Uh, yeah. It feels like the fee market is another area where I've been doing more research. I think it's one of the areas where Solana can be further optimized. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's we have well, we have Anatoly and uh, Ben coming on the pod, so we'll we'll yeah. dig into fees with them. Your anniversary of a pod that we did yeah. um, when everything was kind of the worst moment. So that should be really good. Who else do we have on? Just to give people, we have more. some we have some good apps. We have um. There's some good apps on campus. We have a deep in, have a deep in discussion. Oh, we have a deep in debate with uh, Kyle and uh, and Dimitri. We have uh, Logan Jaskremski from uh, from Frictionless coming on. We've yeah. got the uh, the guys at Kinto coming on. Uh, That's Del too. Got. I like him. Yeah. Yeah, we've got Ilya from Near coming on. Talk oh. about Near's new DA stuff. Uh, we've got Hasib and Avichal coming back to the table. So yeah, a lot of good apps lined up. That's awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, my friend, we're just above the hour mark. So uh, get some sleep, sir. How many places I need to end it. Uh, go have your trad vibe meetings and, uh, you know. I will. That's great. All right, folks. Well, thanks so much for listening and stay safe. Don't play with leverage. <laughs> we'll see you next, next week. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Really hope you enjoyed it. We wanted to take a second to just remind you about our upcoming Digital Assets Summit in London, March 18th to 20th. Santi and I got your back. Seats are limited and we hooked you up with a 20% off discount code. It is Empire20. If you heard it earlier in the podcast, there's a little competition running at Blockworks to see who can drive the most number of tickets. So when you register for the Digital Assets Summit, make sure you use our code Empire20. See you in London.